The three volumes uh, came out of a, uh, a project in which I've been involved for 25 years. Uh, it is the uh, creation of a transnational museum of the First World War in France uh, at Peyron on the Somme, where the Battle of the Somme happened on the 1st of July, 1916. The French uh, scholars with whom I've been working, alongside German scholars and others, have created a research center in the museum that I helped design and still enjoy 25 years later, uh, halfway between Calais and Paris. And that uh, group of scholars in a research center are the editorial team that created this uh, three-volume history of the First World War. <clears throat> we chose to divide the project into three parts. Everything in France is divided into three parts. Uh, one on combat, basically on global war around the world. One on uh, political history in the broadest sense, the state and what happened to the state under the pressure of war. And civil society, which is about everyday life and uh, the role played uh, by families, um, doctors, and so on, in the construction of societies that could withstand the white heat uh, of total war. Uh, it took us um, five years to do, uh, but it took a lot longer to accumulate the point of view uh, that we adopt. Um, the way I like to think about this project is that it's the summary of 40 years of work in the last generation of the history of the First World War. The, the history of the First World War uh, was understood, lived, experienced as a history of states, of nations, of empires, um, which fought for world dominance. Over the last 40 years, we've had a range of enormous changes in our life that we call globalization. Uh, and that has made the boundaries of the nation state less important than they were before. The notion of a transnational history is a complement to national history. It's a way of doing national history better. Uh, better because it enables us to see war as uh, multifaceted, uh, involving changes on levels below the nation state and above the nation state. There were 70 million men who crossed national boundaries in order to wage war. This is the biggest migratory movement, transnational migratory movement, probably for a, a millennium. That change can't be understood uh, simply on the national level. So the idea of transnational history is to bring uh, a new uh, perspective to the history of nation states and to make people aware of how global a conflict it was. The primary reason why the First World War was not the war to end all wars is that the major combatants, victorious combatants, were imperial powers. And they adopted a strategy to break up the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the uh, Turkish Empire and the Russian Empire too, which was self-determination, meaning that subject people should have their own way uh, of organizing their political and social life. Not for the empires of Britain and France though. hence. What was set in motion in 1918 uh, was uh, both the summit, the apogee of empire, and the beginning of the end of empire. And the empires successively have unfolded in violence that created the states of India and Pakistan, uh, that created uh, the, the new state of South Africa, and so on. All of these <clears throat> movements came out of the First World War. The one that doesn't fit, that is to say, decolonization leading to self-determination is the Middle East. And the Middle East created the peace to end all peace. It's still the case that the wars, multiple ones in Syria and Palestine, Iraq, Egypt, all of that is a direct outcome of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1918 without uh, a stable substitute, since all of those countries were subject to imperial rule uh, until the Second World War after. 
So it is failed decolonization that came out of the attempt to give people self-determination half-heartedly by imperial powers that still wanted to retain their control that uh, accounts for this astonishing uh, uh, continuity of violence in one critical part of the world. First World War was the Great War, not in the sense of being a very big war, bigger than any before, uh, but in the, in the sense of it being revolutionary. Um, it not only uh, destroyed four empires and changed the face of the world, but it transformed uh, the battlefield. In 1914, Napoleon would have understood what he would be seeing where he transported uh, to the Battle of the Marne. But in 1918, he would think he was on the other side of the moon uh, with aircraft and artillery and tanks uh, connected in organic ways to the infantry. There were, gas warfare, something revolutionary. Uh, there were, I think, many changes that um, led to what I call a degeneration of war, war that was worse than ever before. And one of them was the blurring and then the obliteration of the boundary between civilian and military targets. The first genocide of the 20th century was the Armenian genocide. Uh, and that was civilian targets entirely by uh, uh, one country, uh, or one empire, deciding that uh, a fifth column within it, which again is a phrase from a Spanish Civil War later, but uh, nonetheless, these individuals who had no arms, uh, who were identifiably civilians, were targets because it was understood that the Armenians weren't loyal to the effort and maybe more loyal to the Russians who were the opponents. All of these changes created a revolution in warfare, the consequences of which we're still living today. The word great, I think, uh, means uh, monstrous, means enormous, means terrible, uh, means terrifying. Uh, it was a conflict uh, that was very, very difficult uh, for those who went into it to imagine. And of course, the, it was great in another sense that the war that the men of 1914 18 joined wasn't the war they got. It was a much, much worse war than any of them had ever imagined. There are many positive things that came out of it. The most important was that millions of men who fought under abominable conditions, conditions pushing human beings beyond the limits of human endurance, there were millions of men who came out of that as recognizable human beings. The French veterans created a pacifist veterans movement. There were bonds across the lines. Australians and Turks shared the creation of their nations and still share a sense of uh, common destiny that was created without either of them having any idea that it would work that way uh, at Gallipoli in 1915. There were many other things. Next time you go to your dentist, think about the First World War because Novocaine uh, was developed in the First World War. There were psychiatric treatments for shell shock that we now use regularly uh, for uh, mental illness of all kinds. There were what I would call side effects that were positive, uh, but the overall uh, bilan French or uh, accounting of it is inevitably going to go back to the 10 million men who died and the 25 million men who were wounded or disabled. Uh, nothing, nothing remotely like that is on the positive side of the First World War. We want to be ecumenical in the Cambridge history, so we present multiple viewpoints on the question of command. Uh, there are those who believe that there was a learning curve where no one had ever seen this battlefield before from 1915 to 1918. And it took a long time to understand how to master it. There are others who uh, support the view that there was no learning curve, there was a bleeding curve, uh, and the commanders of, on both sides uh, were much better at tactics than strategy. That is to say, they could move men around and maybe even make a small uh, breakthrough, but they can't, couldn't make a major breakthrough. The war would not be won by a breakthrough. Most of the commanders were cavalrymen who believed that you make a hole in the line and then you send the cavalry in and then everyone goes home. This was industrial war. There wasn't going to be any such thing. So what we do in multiple ways is to describe the very mixed efforts of the commanders of the armies on all fronts, you know, from Africa uh, to the Middle East, uh, to the Eastern Front, 
we give special e emphasis to the Italian front for the first time in, uh, in a major history of the First World War, and to show how the topography, literally the landscape, defeated uh, the attempts of the commanders to move their forces in such a way as to break through and win. Uh, the war was not won that way, it was, it was won by attrition, by slow and steady application of the material and men of the entire world, the imperial world of the West, against the Austrian and, uh, and German forces who didn't have an empire. And after all, the key point is that Germany fought a war to gain an empire, but needed an empire to win the war. And without that empire, she didn't have the extraordinary backup that made it possible for the war to be won, as it were, by the strongest global powers. Uh, what we do is, in a global history is to talk about the uprooting of civilian life. And that means talking about refugees. The icon, the icon of the 20th century for me is the refugee with a pack of uh, belongings over his shoulder. That icon was created in 1914. Uh, first to get out of the uh, the Schlieffen Plan and the battles of 1914. You know, a million Belgians alone were refugees within a couple of months. But by 1917, for instance, uh, one out of every five people in the western part of the Russian Empire were on the move. They literally had to leave their homes because of the fighting on the Eastern Front. Enormous population movements made civilian life difficult, if not impossible. And with that, there was, as well, a greater degree of danger faced by civilians in war than ever before. Of course, civilians had always been maltreated. Rape had happened, a pillage of all kinds. This goes back to, uh, to ancient uh, wars. But what happens in the First World War is the targeting of civilians deliberately to make them uh, vulnerable in such a way as to suggest that it might be possible or beneficial uh, for the two sides to come to, uh, to terms. The targeting of civilians happened on so many different levels. Uh, one of them was the Allied blockade uh, of Germany and of Austria. Now that blockade carried on after the armistice, which is a violation of international law. But it was done in order to make sure that the civilian population of Germany felt what it was like, suffered. Now the targeting of civilians took place because of the developments of air power, not surely on the level of the Second World War, but it was the beginning. You know, bombs dropped on a, a, a child's a children's school in Hackney are no different in their outcome than the Blitz. It's just much smaller. It's the beginning. It's the beginning that you look up and you see where death can come. Uh, from under the, the sea, think of uh, the Lusitania. The U-boat campaigns targeted civilians. There was no question about unrestricted submarine warfare meant anybody on a boat was like, likely to drown if a torpedo, torpedo hit it. And then came the, the question uh, of uh, the incarceration of civilians. This is something very few people know. The concentration camp experience of the Second World War was anticipated in the first. It's not that they were invented in 1914-18. That, you know, that privilege can be accorded to earlier um, uh, wars in the Philippines and, and in South Africa. But there were literally thousands of civilians who were incarcerated because of their nationality. And they were incarcerated as, at times and moved within their own territories. And in Russia, for instance, the Jewish population of Western Russia had to leave. Now, the, the treatment of civilians as what I would call human stock that could be moved around and used for certain purposes is what we associate with the Nazis. Unfortunately, the precedents are there before. So what happens in uh, volume three of the Cambridge history when we talk about civil society is we, we talk about something much worse than a munitions factory, which is important primarily in Western Europe, but by shifting the, the center of gravity of the war to the east and making it global, we can see, I think, the monstrous character of war in its true light. <laughs>